Have you ever seen that bumper sticker right there? Do you see it? That coexist bumper sticker? I see them all the time. You know, it has the crescent moon of Islam, it has the peace symbol, it has the equal rights, the Star of David, uh, and then the yin and yang, and then the cross. What we need to understand from Revelation 17 is the connection between Satan's religion and paganism and how that plays out with the end of the world. So back to Genesis, I mean, back from Genesis to Revelation 17. And let me read the first verse. And it said, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, now remember where we are, we saw starting in chapter six, the seals, and then in chapter eight, the trumpets, and then starting in chapter 11, verse 15, the bowls. And now look what we've come to. The seven bowl angel came out and said, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls is showing us in the 17th chapter, Satan's ongoing system of counterfeiting God's truth. See, Satan puts up his own counterfeit, his lies. And what Satan's plan is, in verses 1 through 6 of Revelation 17, it's exposed. God says, this is Satan's plan. So God turns the light on and said, Satan has constantly wanted to counterfeit my plan. He wants you to doubt God's plan so that you'll take his plan. Secondly, his plan is explained. That's Revelation 17, 7 through 15. So it's exposed, first six verses. And the, the next nine verses, it's explained, and then God extinguishes it. In other words, he destroys this world religion. And that's, that's culminating uh, after he covers materialism with the second coming of Christ. So we're going to see that destruction. So Revelation 17 can be divided into three sections. Exposing Satan's plan, explaining his plan, extinguishing it. So let's do that first, exposing Satan's religions versus the true bride of Christ. Uh, Revelation 17 is the collapse of the apostate church. Uh, it's described, starting in verse 2, all the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Uh, they've made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Uh, you say fornication. Now, is this, what are we talking about? God said this, to understand this idea of fornication, look back at 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11, remember, Analogia Scriptura, the scriptures explain the scriptures. In 2 Corinthians 11, in verse 2, Paul explains the church, the local church, what every one of us here are a part of. And Paul says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. So the church, each of us individually, I am engaged to Jesus Christ. I am headed toward a marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19. I am headed to heaven, to the place he's prepared for me. He is the one I am marrying that is going to provide for me, protect me, that is going to nurture me, that is going to give me endless delights for eternity. That is pictured as marriage to Jesus Christ. And, you know, for us, we've, we're kind of tainted. We think, mm, you know, marriage and Christ and, and our view of marriage is a little bit tainted because it's, we're fallen. And so we think, is that really good? That's kind of a sexual metaphor. Is that something positive? Well, look what it says. I have betrothed you to one husband. I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Show up at that marriage supper with uh, a, a chaste virgin. But look at verse 3. But I fear lest somehow, this is 2 Corinthians eleven three, 3, as the serpent deceived Eve. Oh, look over here. This is Genesis 3. Paul is exactly tying religion, this harlot that we see in chapter 17 of Revelation. He's tying that back to Genesis 3. And as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds will be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Totally tying together the 
the religion going our own way that Satan's promoting with God's true plan. That, that we, the instant we're saved, we're betrothed to Christ. And we will explain that more. Uh, what is Mystery Babylon? Chapter 17 is about the great whore we see in the first six verses. She rides the beast with seven heads and ten horns. She's the mother of harlots and abominations, and she's drunk with the saints. Did you know more Christians have been killed by religion than anything else? That's what's going on, and that's what this chapter is talking about. The next time we get together in chapter 18, we're looking at Babylon the Great, the city, kings and merchants and all those that trade by sea. Now, mystery Babylon in chapter 17 is tying together what I showed you right here. Now, now look at Babel here. Now look at the slide in front of you. Semiramis, Ishtar, Ashtaroth, Isis, Aphrodite, and Venus. Have you ever heard of any of those? The Roman Venus, uh, the, the Greek god Aphrodite, Egyptians, we have Isis. All of these are these fertility gods of ancient religion. All of them come from Semiramis from Babel, Tower of Babel, Ishtar from Syria, Ashtaroth, the constant nemesis for Israel, came from Phoenicia, Isis, the Israelites picked up in their time in Egypt, Aphrodite from the Greek world, and of course Venus was the, the goddess of love from the Roman world. And basically, always, now this is getting a little heavy, this is history, but think about this. In all of, of false religion that Satan has spawned and invented, there's always a mother goddess, Semiramis, who has a son, Tammuz. Or Ishtar has a son, also called Tammuz. Or Ashtaroth has a son, you all know the name of this one, Baal. Ashtaroth, mother. Baal, son. Uh, Isis in Egypt has a son, Osiris. Have you studied much about Greek, I mean, uh, Egyptology and all the false religions of the pyramids and everything? Isis, the mother, Osiris, the son. Aphrodite, the mother. Eros, the son, and of course, everyone knows this one, Venus, the mother in Rome, and Cupid, the son. You know, Valentine's Day, the little fat, you know, naked cherub, that's Cupid. That is mystery Babylonian religion. You say, what does it have to do with anything? Well, let me just share with you, just real quickly, we'll cover this in detail to come, but the mother goddess, whichever one it is, you know, Isis or Ashtaroth or, or Venus, uh, in mystery religions has a son, and this son is out hunting and gets killed by a wild animal, and the animal tears up the son. The mother goes and collects the pieces of the son, now listen, and mourns for him for 40 days, and at the end of 40 days, the son rises from the dead. Uh-oh, wait a minute. The beloved son of the mother is killed, mourned for 40 days, and rises from the dead? What is 40 days long in Christendom? Lent. Where did Lent come from? It's not in the Bible. It's a direct manufacture of Satan into, right here in Pergamos, the church. And that's what we're going to study in this lesson. But before we go too far ahead of ourselves, remember the two women? I told you about it three classes ago when we were in chapter 12. I said that, that Israel in chapter 12 is this woman clothed with the sun, moon, and stars, attacked by the dragon, who has a son who's protected by the Lord. That's the woman in chapter 12, Israel. Look at chapter 17. This woman's riding the beast on many waters. She's the mother of harlots. She's clothed in purple, scarlet, and gold. She reigns in the earth. Ten kings follow her, and the dragon sustains her, not God. See the contrast between Israel and chapter 17, 
this great whore. Well, Satan's plan exposed. Look at chapter 11 again, if you're still there. My Bible's still open to 2 Corinthians 11. Look at verse 14. It says, I'll start in 13. For such are false apostles, see all this error coming into the church, uh, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, look at verse 14, 2 Corinthians 11, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. What is Satan's plan? Satan's plan is to counter God's plan and to tell people they can go their own way to God by achieving, by working hard, by religion, by doing the five pillars of Islam or following the, the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church or knocking door to door Jehovah's Witnesses or going to the temple in Salt Lake City. Religion is not God's way. In the next slide, you see Cain, the Tower of Babel, the beast, and the final world religion. Do you remember what happened after Satan deceived Adam and Eve and they fell into sin? God provided a way for them to come back. Do you remember how the Lord killed animals uh, in their place, kind of a substitutionary sacrifice, clothed them with those animal skins, and told them how they could come to an altar. So God's way was substitution of a kind of what we call a substitutionary sacrifice that you came to by faith. See, that's the gospel that's been around since the Garden of Eden. God says you need a substitute who dies in your place and you by faith trust him. And the first convert that Satan gets to his false plan of religion was Cain. And Cain brought, the Bible says in chapter four, the, the best of his produce, not a substitutionary animal whose blood, see, it had to be a sacrifice of blood, it had to be, remember Leviticus 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood. There had to be the shedding of blood of a life given through sacrificial death. And that was God's plan. And so right from creation in the Garden of Eden, God said, my plan involves you trusting in a substitute. And that's why, do you, do you know what the Jewish sacrificial system was? The Jewish people were to bring a lamb or a little bull or whatever um, clean animal that was prescribed in the law to the priest and the priest would take it, look at it, make sure it was a proper animal. And then the priest would hold it while the, the person bringing the sacrifice put their hands on the head of that animal and confessed over it their sins. What they were doing is they were saying, this animal is substituting in my place. Then the priest killed it and the person was not forgiven because they put their hands on the head or the animal died, but what? They trusted by faith in the substitute. That's the gospel. But from Cain, the Tower of Babel, all the way through, Satan has had a plan. Well, how did all of that get into the church? Well, right here in Babel, the Tower of Babel, the, the origin of paganism comes in the beginning. The organized religion was 24 centuries BC in the plain of Shinar over in what we would call modern day Babylon. The first full-time minister of Satan was Nimrod. He's mentioned. He's Noah's wicked and apostate grandson. Secular history tells us that Nimrod married a woman who's called Semiramis. Now remember the mother, son, Semiramis and Tammuz? That comes from right here. So we, actually the first convert was here, but the first organized religion starts right here in Babel. And basically this idea of worshiping the pagan, false, idolatrous religion of Satan's way instead of God's way gets into Israel, grows in Israel. Uh, in fact, this next slide shows it. It's in chapter 44 of Jeremiah, verses 17 to 19. Semiramis becomes what, what Balaam introduces them to worship in Israel 
becomes the queen. It says in uh, Jeremiah 44, they call Semiramis the queen of heaven. And she's worshipped with little, little wafers that talks about in Jeremiah 44. They have a T on them for Tammuz. And they worship her as the one. Tammuz is the mother. Uh, I mean, um, Ashtaroth is the mother. And Tammuz is the son. And the son, Tammuz, was killed mourned, rises from the dead, and was worshipped. And that's what goes on from the time of Balaam all the way through in Israel's history till the destruction of Israel. And in Jeremiah 44, the words queen of heaven are found five times in that book. And Semiramis is called the queen of heaven. Uh, Semiramis was worshipped by the offering of a wafer cake with her son's name on it. She began the 40 days of weeping before the feast of celebrating his resurrection, which is brought into the church by this paganism merging with the church. How, how did that happen? Well, see the slide, Revelation 2, 12 to 17? In Pergamos, the ancient mystery religions of Babylon were brought by Julius Caesar. You know, Julius Caesar, the, the first Roman kind of emperor that was actually martyred because he, or murdered because he tried to become the emperor, and then his nephew Octavius became the emperor. He so believed in this mystery religion that he imported it from Babylon to Asia Minor, to a shrine that he set up, and all of these priests of, of Semiramis and Tammuz and of all this pagan mystery religion comes to this city and this city began to follow the ways of Balaam, mystery religion, and Jesus condemns them, see, in verses 12 to 17. The saints at Pergamos had gotten too close to the wickedness of idol worship around them. They slowly got comfortable going back to the old haunts of those idols, and idolatry is very hard to resist. But what, what happened next? Constantine. In 313 AD, the Roman emperor legalized Christianity. And what he did is, he said, Constantine said, what we'll do is we'll take all of the pagan priests of Rome and merge them with the church of Christ, of Christianity. And that's what became the Roman, that's this part, Catholic, that's this part, church. That's when paganism through Constantine in 313 AD, that's when the paganism of Rome, mother, son, religion, 40 days, wafers with teas, and all these priests merged together. Look at the next slide. This is the growth of the Roman Catholic Church. What we see in Revelation 13 has taken a long time to, to take place. The early church, the, the early church that resisted all of this and, and was opposed to it, merged into the Roman Catholic Church. Now see, this is the early church of the book of Acts and the apostles of Jesus Christ. The early church morphs into the Roman Catholic Church by Constantine's 313, merging together of all the pagan priests. See, Constantine was a politician. He says, I, I can't get rid of all those temples and I can't get rid of all those state-sponsored you know, priests of, of this Semiramis stuff. What I'll do is I'll just put you together and make one big religion. What happens by 593 AD, that's about 600, uh, 600 uh, AD, at that time, 300 years after Constantine, the Roman Catholic Church is full-blown and they start the doctrine of purgatory. Can you see that on the slide? It's really small print. Then they go into the idea of clergy being, you know, not able to be married and there, there's the great divorce actually in 1075. And then the Inquisition starts. 
Uh, then indulgences begin. And then transubstantiation. Do you know what transubstantiation is? It's part of this whole wafer thing where the priest would hold up a normal piece of bread and say it through the, the offering to the gods in the old days, and then in the Roman Catholic Church, through the incantation of uh, the, the, this is my body, hoc es corpus meum, it changed normal bread into the body of Christ. That's what happened in the Catholic Church. And works, not faith, was the way to heaven. And then we have the Reformation. And then from the Reformation, we have the Evangelical Church and the Great Missions Movement. And now where are we today? We have the whole Charismatic and Renewal Church. What do all the early church, the Catholic Church, the Reformation Church, the Evangelical and the Charismatic, what do they all have in common? The Bible. Now look at this. This much of Roman Catholicism is absolutely true. This much of the Reformation Church was based on the Bible. This much of the Evangelical Church, and this much of the Charismatic Church, and this much of the early Church. But all of the iterations that followed have the part that's not in the Bible. What's Romanism? The damnable doctrine of works, that you can earn your way. What about the Reformation Church? What we call theological drift, which basically is this. Verse of the Bible, verse of the Bible, conclusion from that verse. Verse of the Bible, verse of the Bible, conclusion from that verse. Now, these conclusions are directly anchored to the scripture. Watch this. Conclusion from two conclusions is theological drift. This doctrine is no longer tied to the scripture. It may be true, but it's not scriptural. It's logical. And that's what we come up with in the Reformation Church. That's where we get such things as dual predestination. They said that God predestines some people to hell and some to heaven. Have you ever heard that doctrine? That is, that is very clearly a part of the Reformation Church. Is that in the Bible? Do you find that here? No, but you find it logically here. And then what did the, what did the evangelical church do? They got into the problem of traditions over the word. What's one of the clearest ones? We call it invitationalism. That is a real blight. Invitationalism is that if you raise your hand or pray a prayer, you're saved. No matter whether God does anything to you or not, if you did that, you're saved. Now, the Bible says, whoever calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. But what it says is when God saves you, Acts 26, 18, you get a new heart and a new spirit. But invitationalism, which started uh, basically in about 1830, was if you had a, a good, very powerful preacher, and he told people to come to the front, and they did, they thought that by them coming to the front or praying or doing something, they got saved. And that's where the church gradually got diluted. And then, of course, the Charismatic Renewal Church has so much truth in it, but their excesses and experience has taken over the word.